Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 243 for Monday, February 10th, 2020. Thanks, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show that's by, for, and about working musicians. This episode is sponsored by ChauvetDJ.com. We'll tell you why you want to go there. There's a new product that we'll tell you all about a little bit later. Right now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And without a doubt, here in San Jose, California, it's Paul Kim. It's, it's locked in I now. Right. Yeah, I yeah. Then, right. you, then you're going to move again, and, and, and it's going to be all screwed up. So, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> The good news is, you know, it like we're here together. It's, I don't even know why I got into the habit of saying where we're from uh, as we intro the show. I mean, it's kind of cool because if there's people around us, like, you know, yeah. they know. And I guess that's why. You do that on the other shows? Yeah, I totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know why, but it, you know, it's like, it's cool, I guess. It's but cool. it's it's not relevant. I mean, except except when, except to whom and when it is. So there you go. What is relevant, though, is that it's February and as it <laughs> this was not planned, but, you know, there's that whole uh, RPM project thing in February, uh, the whole uh, or the February RPM uh, recording um, uh, thing, the RPM challenge. That's what I not RPM project, the RPM challenge. I don't know what this is. What is it? Yeah. It, so the RPM challenge is this annual thing. It's kind of like Nano Remo which is mm -hmm. the in November every year, it's the National Novel Writing Month. Well, the RPM challenge happens in February. And the idea is uh, for musicians to create a whole album of music, 10 songs or 35 minutes uh, in the month of February. And it's not a contest, just like Nano Remo is not a contest, but it's it's just a thing. You know, it's like encourage people to like record stuff, which is cool. It's just a thing. And it's winter. So why not? You know, uh, now. The So what I did is not really an RPM challenge thing because it definitely won't be out by March 1st. Uh, but this weekend, I had the distinct pleasure of recording uh, a bunch of tunes with Bitter Pill, my friend Billy's band, uh, in the studio. And um, we wound up going to this studio near us. So we did. We recorded everything in the month of February. That's that's kind of where the RPM challenge thing comes and goes. But, and we sort of realized it while we were there. It's like, hey, wait a minute. It's February. We're doing this. That's cool. Uh, but um, we went to this studio that a friend of ours, Chris Chase, runs. He uh, it's a, in a town north of me called Dover, just one town north. Uh, Chris has been. He has owned a studio for years. I had been at his previous studio, which was a couple towns north of me. And uh, and and he had a really nice setup there, a really cool room. I had never recorded there, but my daughter's band recorded it at his place. Mm -hmm. And I really liked it. And I was like, oh, and he's a good engineer, you know, and he, he takes that role of producer really well. And I was really impressed with him for the day that we spent there with um, with her band and, uh, and a couple of the other, you know, dads of the band kind of thing. But um, but he moved and I had not been to his new place. His new place is called the noise floor in Dover. And holy crap, like this is as pro a studio as could possibly exist. Uh, he's got I'm trying to think he's got one big sort of great room that I'll call it. Then he's got two full isolation rooms uh, and then various as often happens in studios, you know, various little pockets of isolation like if there's a hallway it's like well let's put doors on either end of the hallway and put some xlr jacks in the walls and if we need a vocal booth here it is you know that kind of thing uh but he's really so i had you know where my drums were was completely isolated from everything else i could see everyone there was double glass everywhere everything is the floors are all floated and uh you know as you would do in a studio and and it's everything separated from one another so there's really no transference of sound um, between any of these isolation rooms and it, the, the great part about a studio like that. And then of course his, his, um, the engineering room is, you know, separate from that too. And, uh, the great part about that is you can record a full band live with everything isolated. 
and they all stood in the great room. Billy plays cello in this band as the bass. Uh, there is no bass player. It's Billy on cello. And, mm. and it's, he has a piezo pickup in it, but it's, he also mic'd it for this, but even he was able to be in the great room. Uh, Chris just used some, uh, some baffles to sort of surround him so that that didn't bleed into the other acoustic instruments that were also being recorded in that room. And then uh, our friend John McCormick played guitar on the record, electric guitar and his aunt, he was able to stand in the main room, but his amps were in the, you know, one of the other isolation rooms and man, what a blast we had. It really came together so easily and, and quickly everybody was, you know, it was just such a good vibe and it, I mean, that's part of part of that's the band. Right. But part of that is the the engineer and simply having an engineer, you know, is great. We're, I, I say that in contrast to what we've been doing here in this studio, in my studio with Fling, where we're working on sort of the next batch of of songs that we're recording here. And we're doing it ourselves, which is, you know, also fine. But I had kind of forgotten how nice it was to have somebody else sort of taking care of that side of things. Just play. Yeah, yeah. And just play. And and it, Chris really takes on the role of producer far more than many engineers. There, if you don't have a producer, oftentimes the engineer sort of becomes your de facto producing partner uh, in the project. Right. Because, you know, you, you, he's he's there. He or she is there. And sharing ideas and like, ah, I think maybe you should try another take or, hey, give me another one of those. I, you know, try this a little differently. I, I want some options to experiment with. And he was really good about it. And, and there was a lesson there, you know, especially as we're heading into this thing with Fling, where it's like, yeah, you know, you to, to get the best performances out of people in the moment in the studio is not necessarily the time to offer, you know, corrections uh, or, or I mean, it can be, but there needs, there really needs to be that trust. It's more encouragement. Like, Hey, do more of that. That was good. Mm -hmm. Not less of the stuff that was bad. You know what I mean? Like, like that, that coaching, uh, through the performances and, and getting people to a point where they're relaxed enough to just deliver a solid performance was, yeah. you, you know, it, which, so I, I haven't done a lot of recording in my life, Dave, but um, the stuff that I have done, a lot of it has been with, I talk about my friend, Mary Ellen, her husband, Tom is a pretty extraordinary. Yep. I don't want to say engineer. I, I mean, I would say it's the other way around. And when I record with Tom and he, you know, we, it's a great studio that he, that he works through. Um, the technical part is the blocking and tackling and it kind of almost disappears. I mean, Tom is focused on the performance. Yeah. He'll coach you through a vocal line, I mean, and again, he knows where to assert and where to lay back. And I, I, that model really makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, and he, you know, if, if the artist says, nope, I like it this way, he, you know, knows when to probe and knows when to lay back. But really the engineering part of it is the blocking and tackling. It is, it is, you know, it is not the point of the process. It is really in the background and that's a good way to do it. And I think if you have a guy who's an engineer, I mean, I, I, when I have done recording in the past where, the engineer is taking so long to achieve what he wants technically and try different things. Mm -hmm. All the, all the energy of the performance is just, you're just exhausted, just waiting. Right. Yo, I mean, yeah. It, well, it, it, there's a time and a place for that. And sometimes the, 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 that time is in the moment, but more often than not, it's, it's not in the moment, right? It's af well after the fact when, when the performances are done and everybody can just sort of back off and, and the engineer can then go dive in but um, but yeah, no, you need an engineer who can keep things moving along and and keep the mood where it needs to be, too. I mean, for most of us, we don't have the luxury of a producer and an engineer. So the question is, right. that one guy that you probably get, is he more engineer? Is he more producer? Is he down the middle? You know, what are well, you, his you need? What does I, he like to do? I would say you need a an engineer. If that if you have somebody that doesn't understand. No, the blocking and tackling has to be solid. Has that, to be there. Good, has to be. But what I'm saying is, is that this stuff has been, you know, using DAWs, using desks, you, you know, the process of recording. Um, uh, it seems like you should be able to um, find that guy who the the technology is not the point of things. I did, right. I did an EP not a long time ago. And the guy was more of an engineer than he was a producer. He, he was helpful sure. in pointing out some field things, but it was more, you know, a focus on the technology. Let's try it 
like this and you know let me make this adjustment and the and the focus was on tweaking the technology to the performance as uh, uh no that's with a good and well that's a i would say and I, and I I wasn't there, so I'm going solely <laughs> on your description. But I would say that's a bad engineer, right? Like the, 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 an engineer's point is to be out of the way, it, 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 right? Like the, the best engineer, you don't know that they're there unless they're playing a role as producer or something. But otherwise, it's just like roll tape. You do your job so that everyone else has the flexibility and freedom to do theirs and isn't held yeah. up by you. So so I yeah I I I think. It, an, an, a slow engineer or an less than competent enough in, engineer, I don't want to say incompetent, but less than competent enough engineer would be the would be the problem. But I will yeah. say, you know, watching Chris. So on, I was there. The plan was for me to record four songs with them, I think. Yeah. Um, and we did four. Uh, we did all four of those on Friday. Uh, we did three in the morning and then and then there was one tune where Billy really wanted everybody to kind of, he wanted this vibe of like a, a noisy bar room. So Friday night at 10 o'clock for the last hour, we brought in uh, a bunch of friends and stuff and and gave him like beers and, and champagne glasses to clink and things like that just to make noise in the background. And we recorded that song with that particular vibe. So that that was that night on on Friday. But then there was another tune uh, that we wanted drums on. So I was like, OK, well. We'll, I'll come back Saturday and do that. Not every song that bitter pill has is being recorded with drums live. We mostly play them all with drums, but, uh, but you know, they're, they're a band that, that survived for well over a year without ever having a drummer at their gigs. Mm. So they, they, they are, I mean, to say that they're capable of playing without a drummer sort of sends the wrong message. <laughs> it's like they do not need a drummer. A drummer is an, is an added bonus. Um, hopefully a bonus. Uh, <laughs> but um, so we recorded another song Saturday morning that, that needed drums. And, and, and we did that together as a full band. So all of those, those first songs were recorded as a full band. And then Saturday night, I get a text from Billy and wisely. Uh, we had all decided to just leave my drum set up in the studio until we were done with the session. And Saturday night, I get a call from Billy or a text from Billy. Hey, can you be here like within the next hour and a half? We want drums on this, this one last song. And I couldn't, but I said, I can come tomorrow, you know, on Sunday. So they recorded the song without me there. They recorded it live, you know, as, as the, uh, uh, as the band without drums. And then I came in on Sunday and recorded drums to it. Now it's a song. I think I've played it live with the band once. It's a very new song. So there's no, like, there's no history with it. There's no, this is how it goes kind of thing. I mean, it, it, it's been written, but there's no, you know, performance history with it really. And so it's, it's pretty loose, open to interpretation. And so I was able to go in and just play and I didn't have to worry about is somebody else, you know, getting a good take on this track too. You know, my, my whole thing going into the studio, my prime directive is do no harm. Right. You, and you have to go in with that, like serve the song. It's not about me. It's about making sure the, the overall song, which is partially me is good. Right. So a lot of times, especially for, you know, session type stuff and to call bitter pill, a session gig for me is a little bit disingenuous, but, uh, but, there, but there was certainly some of that vibe because these aren't songs that I know really, really well. So it's like, okay, I gotta, I gotta sort of be a little conservative with how I play uh, and do no harm. And part of that do no harm is not adding things in that get in the way of the song. But the other part of that is not screwing up the other musicians, like laying it down for them so that they can deliver their best performances too. Right. It's that, that whole serving the song thing. And uh, Sunday I got to kind of throw that out the window sort of unintentionally because I sat down and it was like, okay, look, I don't know the form of this song. So I just told him we all decided, I mean, it, everybody was sort of on the same page. It was like, let's just, let me just play through it a couple of times so that I can get the form and figure out, you know, where there should be a fill, where there shouldn't be, you know, there were already vocals on the track, which was good so that I could you know, play around them and not get in the way of those and all of that. The guitar solo was already done, which was a really nice treat. Uh, to be able to actually play with with the finished version of that instead of some scratch version or no version of that, you know, and uh, 
So I played through it a couple times and it was like, all right, got it. I, I, now I understand the form of this song. And there were some good ideas that came up and we kept talking through those as, as it happened. And then I did it two more times and I was like, all right, now I'm ready. And Chris comes on in the ears. He's like, come on back in. We're done. I'm like, <laughs> uh, no, I don't think we're done, Chris. Like, I'm, I'm not happy with that last. There's no one performance I'm happy with. He's like, come on in, listen, and we'll talk about it. I'm like, okay, fine, fine. You know, I, by that point, you know, I was like, you got to throw some trust into the engineer, like, you know, the slash producer. And, and he very much played both roles. There's no question. And so we played, we played it and listened back to the to sort of the two, you know, final tracks. And, uh, but he recorded all four takes and it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. And I'm like, Matt here. And he's like, yeah, but you did that better the second time, you know? And I was like, yeah. And he, he, he uses pro tools in his studio. And this guy is like, it taught me the lesson of how important it is, especially going into this fling project that we're doing to be really comfortable with whatever DAW digital audio workstation you choose to use, especially when it comes to chopping together multiple takes into one, uh, because he, the, the final drum part on this song is from all four takes the intro. The first wow. intro that I played just came. I mean, it was just this stupid thing that I did. And now I got to go back and relearn how to do it, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it was just like I, I, I did this thing. that was like, oh, that's really weird. But it totally locked in with the tune. He's like, yeah, I'll just bring that over. And then, you know, he chopped in this fill from that take. And, you know, I think it was mostly the final take. And then he sort of added in the things that he liked from, you know, one, two and three into take four. And then the way I the pacing with which I played sort of the, the song had a retard at the end. And the pacing with which I played it, he liked. So he was like, all right, I'm just moving the rest of the band to you now. And I described this and it almost happened in less time than it took me to describe it. I mean, it really was less than 10 minutes of his time to like Frankenstein this drum part together to the point where you like even I couldn't tell you right now where the cuts are without looking at it on a screen. I mean, he really did a great job with it. And, you know, it's a multi-track drum part. I mean, we had seven mics on the kit, I want to say, yeah. you know, something like that. Right. It wasn't a one mic thing, but he really like having the skill, the, the comfort, the confidence to do that really sped up our time there because otherwise it would have been, all right, now I got to go try a couple more takes. And, you know, now I'm going to get a little more conservative as each take goes by because it's like, well, I want to get us out of here. I don't want to be the one that screws up a fill to, you know, cause us to have to rewind and do this all over again. And, and I, and I, like I said, I had the luxury of not really ever doing a take where I worried about that. It was more, I'm just practicing and learning and okay, now I'm ready to record. And he's like, you're done. Like, Oh, hmm. that's interesting. So, uh, so he was able to take the role of, you know, do no harm. And, and, and we, and collectively, I mean, it wasn't just him, but it was, you know, he had these ideas and, you know, we all sort of, Billy, especially sort of approved or was like, ah, I don't know, you know, but, um, but it takes a lot of trust, but it was, it inspired me. Yeah. I got to spend some time on an airplane tomorrow. So I'm going to record, you know, a few takes of myself doing something. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, and then bring them with me on my laptop on the plane and just sort of go through chopping up a track and and doing all of that just so I can learn it and get it into my fingers, because that will give us flexibility when we're doing this thing with fling to know that like he knew that he could do this. And so it wasn't like, well, let me see what I can do. It was like, no, I've got this. You know, he he was able to grab the reins. So definitely worth spending some time with your DAW and learning that skill in particular can probably save you more time than it costs you uh, to get there. Just don't drive your bandmates crazy with it. Learn it on your own is sort of the thing there. But anyway, what's uh, the, what DAW do you use in your, in your studio? I use logic pro here. You know, I'm a Mac guy. Are you, good? Are you proficient? I'm pretty proficient. I'm not, that's, that's one area of, of logic pro where I really am not, I've done it, but it, it, I'm, there's clearly a better way than however I've been doing it. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I'm pretty good with it. And and I what I really like about Logic Pro, we've we've just been in the pre-production phases of this with Fling. But what we've been doing is we just record the songs very loosely as we play them through here. 
And Logic Pro, I don't know, whatever the most recent major update was, which I think was 18 months ago or something like that. He um, or he, I say he, I don't know who, who added it. <laughs> Apple added uh, what they call smart tempo to Logic Pro. And it you can just record a track into it and then it analyzes the track and follow. It puts the tempo on the track, but it will follow you if you speed up or slow down. It will follow you there. Uh, so that can be really handy if you've got a tune that that should speed up or, or slow down. But it can also be a really we've thus far we've been using it to just find the right tempo for a tune. And you can even take a live performance and, you know, feed it, feed the, the audio into logic and have it analyze it and just tell you, OK, yeah, here's the tempo. I mean, you could do that with a tap to tempo thing on your phone or whatever. But it's just a really handy way to find like, OK, yeah, this is the tempo of this tune. Like, that's where yeah. it feels good. You know, just let it happen and then figure it out after the fact. So, yeah, I've been it's I have a feeling we'll wind up playing with with smart tempo somewhat. Um, cool. So, yeah, it's fun. You know, it's something to do. I don't know. <laughs> it's something to do. Yeah. I can't wait for this we'll bitter so pill, pill record to be out. So when, when, when will that happen? I, I there's some talk about probably not spring it's probably like there's there's some more mixing to be done on it uh so it's probably going to be late spring is is when uh like the, that would be my earliest hope so a few months at okay. least so yeah i want to talk about our our sponsor though if that's okay please all right sweet yeah chauvet dj as i mentioned in the intro to the show is our sponsor this week and man we've been using chauvet dj gear in fling for years this stuff is reliable this stuff is easy to use it's easy to set up it's lightweight and it makes you look good because chauvet dj makes all the lights and those sort of visual effects for gigging bands yes it's called chauvet dj but trust me when i say that this stuff is just as targeted at gigging bands that is at DJs, because if it wasn't, they wouldn't be advertising here, would they? Think about that, right? They're definitely behind this for gigging bands and their new gig bar move. Oh, this thing. You got to watch the video of this thing. Go to our 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 uh, our web page at gigabpodcast.com or you can go to chauvetdj.com too. But I'll have a link to the video for the gig bar move right there in the in the show notes. This thing has moving head fixtures wash light pars, strobes and lasers all on one bar that because it's all on one bar, it'll set up and tear down in, in minutes. And I truly mean like minutes, like it might be low double digit minutes, but probably not even like single digit minutes to set these things up super easy. And man, this bar, like you got to watch the video. This thing's amazing how, how much it does all tied together. And then of course, you can control it with a foot pedal. You can control it with their BT Air app from your, uh, you know, from your phone or your tablet, whatever. And then, of course, it can all link together, too, if you've got other Chauvet DJ stuff and, and you know, you can really kind of build a, a show. So you've got to you got to go check this out. Go to ChauvetDJ.com. Make your band look good. That way people can see you and enjoy watching you while you're playing all your great music. So ChauvetDJ.com. Our thanks to Chauvet DJ at C H A U V E T D J dot com for sponsoring this episode. Cool stuff. Cool new product. Yeah, for sure. So you had an idea, my friend. Yeah, well, you know, I a lot of times I think about um, kind of that organic nature of having a group together for a, for a long period of time. Mm. And um, the context to this is I I. Funnily enough, I bought a looper. I bought a I bought a looper. Okay. And which and one did you get? About, I got the Boss RC three hundred, the the three channel. Yep. And um, I did it because um, I just want to play around with adding some new approaches to my solo acoustic stuff. And then sure. as I get this, you know, it comes with a rhythm section. It comes with a lot of guitarists are using loopers now to kind of like tap out rhythms um, on their guitar on different parts of the guitar body in order to kind of establish a, sure. a, a percussive type thing and then loop that as a kind of a, a, a basic track. And I was thinking, Oh, this is kind of cool. You know, I, I can do more solo. And that immediately had my mind kind of going over to, but 
you know, remember that thing about a band is still a thing. You know, the thing, the thing about a band, if you want a band, you should have a band, right? And, you know, if you want to present music that has percussion, that has, you know, bass lines, that has, you know, rhythm instruments, don't you want to have a band? So I'm just kind of thinking about, you know, like the, the, the drift that goes on as technology makes certain things available. I think about the very organic and, you know, real social nature of a band. And I wanted to kind of share these observations about the, the kind of like life cycle of a band. You know, a, a band is an amorphous, you know, it's, it, at, at most what a band is, is a, it's an at will arrangement. Right. Nobody's right. holding anybody's gun to anybody's head to keep someone in a band. And I, I want to stop you though. I, I, I think, and I don't think you're, you're, you're necessarily punting on the idea of a looper, but I hope you don't punt on the idea of a looper. I, I, I love that it catalyzed this particular discussion. I think that's actually freaking awesome, <laughs> yeah. but, but like there are cool things that you can do with a looper that no, wouldn't necessarily doubt. happen with, you know, the organic nature of a band. So, and so I, I want to well, encourage you to keep going down that path. I think that's cool. Yes. Some so let, let me, let me, um, let me just put a, a dot on that because we will come back to it in future episodes. Sure. I had just have an interest in trying to finding new sounds and new, yeah. new approaches to performing my, my solo stuff. And so, you know, this is something I'm playing around with and it's fun and it's interesting and it's a good learning tool and it's a good creative tool. And, you know, there's a lot of good things that are coming from it already. Sure. But it did make me think about, you know, bands are bands. And, and I was thinking about my band and I was thinking about this kind of life cycle about how, Collections of human beings pursuing a creative endeavor um, uh, live, and you know, like other, uh, you know, you create, you create a life together. You create a, you create a unit, and and um, that unit goes through different, um, do, different things. Uh, and just to simplify, there's of course the times where everybody's a bro or a sis, and uh, everybody's in love, and everything's great, and it's nirvana, and you go. Yep. There's times when everyone's making everyone crazy. And it's consternation and it's not as joyous as it is, or two guys or three guys out of a band are making each other crazy and it rubs off on the others. And there's, there's strife. That's another phase, but there's also kind of an interesting in between phase where everything's good. Everything's fine. Um, life is imposing its will and you know, there's other things and you go through times where it's not that Nirvana thing. There's also nothing wrong. Guys just show up, play their gig. Great. It's pleasant. It's nice. It's businesslike. And that businesslike um, phase, I think, is an interesting thing because you can freak out about that. You can be like, oh, my God, this is good. Why aren't we closer? Um, you know, you can you can actually focus on that in the wrong way. And I just think like anything organic, things change. You know, you have a trio, you have four or five, 10 guys, whatever it may be. That's four or five or 10 external influences that are, you know, making something happen that will affect your group. And, um, you know, you just kind of live through these things. And, I, and my band is in a very business. We're not rehearsing very much. We're playing about once a week right now. So we're kind of you know getting there. Um, and it just feels like everybody sh and we have been butter for a really, really long time. I think a lot of this is, you know, we, we went through a big change when we changed our drummer, you know, a, a little while ago. And um, we have a great drummer and he is Mr. Consistency. And there is a, there's a dotted line from gig to gig where the grooves just happen and you just sit on it like a nice, comfortable glove and we play. But I would say that, you know, like for me, I notice the, um, the slack traffic you know, there's a little bit less kind of like good natured checking in on each other. Yeah. There's a little yeah. bit less, you know, broing around at the breaks. Right. It's fine. And like I said, there's nothing wrong. There is nothing wrong. It just feels business like it's business like, like. showing up to yeah. work. They're doing a great job at their job. They're saying, hey, good to see you. We'll see you next time. And they go off. That is a phase that. Um, and you're right. That's when you an, have a unit. Oh, that's an OK phase to have. That's, that's sort of the, the, the tough part. You're right. Yeah. Cause you can, I, I would sit and overanalyze like, well, how come everybody's not like, 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 well, why isn't there the slack traffic? Why aren't we, if, why isn't everybody yeah. going to the bar and hanging out together on the set breaks and uh-oh, uh-oh, right? Like that, 
that's not an uh oh moment in and of itself. It's normal. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. And then there'll be times where every again, when you've been together a long time, there are times when you find yourself like, you know what? I got a lot of crazy stuff going on in my life, but this band has been such a constant. It's always there. We have a great time. People love what we do. We mean something to the people we play to. I remember now why this is so awesome. That that will come back and, you know, the stars will line up and it will come back for all the band members. There's, you know, and the other stuff will happen. There'll be cracks, you know, and, and there'll be times of strife. And I think when you go back to that concept that, it's an at will relationship. And you remember that everybody shows up to rehearsal. Everybody shows up to the gigs, you know, because they want to be there. Um, that is the core of how you value, um, value everybody's input and participation. Everybody is choosing to make this better, right? Everybody is choosing to want to be a part of it. And, you know, whatever those external influences are, um, you know, guys having kid problems, you know, sure. spouse problems, work problems, health problems. I mean, whatever it could be, you know, that's part of what comes into that person's art that they bring into your group. And if a band is healthy, I think what you do is you you are almost embrace that if your band is going through these things and still together, even if it's the bad stuff. Right. So even if it's the we're clawing at each other but the band stays together. You're right. It comes out of it the other end. That's incredibly powerful social structure you have. I know in my band, there, there have been times over the years. I mean, we've had, we've had guys get married and we've all celebrated each other's, you know, marriages, certainly birthdays. We've had um, friends pass away where we grieve together. We've had, you know, friends find love. And I mean, all of those experiences are just really remarkable that this little family that we have really goes through those things. And, I used to sweat, you know, I used to, it has to be bros all the time is, you know, that otherwise it won't work. I think if you can take a broader view and understand that if the band stays together, because this at will agreement, people choose to show up all the time. That is a, that speaks stronger to the power of the bonds that you have than, than it having to be bro time all the time. I agree with that. Yeah. Well, you know, you're, your comment that it's a little family, that's a good thing to keep in mind. My, my first thought was, right, it's a family and, and you're going to have these times when everybody's able to get together and is close and interacting with each other. Then you've got these times where people are busy, whether it's problems or good things. There's just things that you're busy with in the, you know, the your personal life, as it were, as opposed to, you know, band life. But. My second reaction to this is, well. It is a family, but it's a chosen family. I, you know, you're coming back to your concept of it's an at will relationship. And that that's important to remember for those of us. And I am definitely in this camp. The people that will start sweating like the, the uh oh moments, as I said before, tempering that with, yeah, you know what? If that if any one of these people didn't want to be here, they don't have to be here. You know, there that is important to remember because that alone says they want to be there. And that's a good thing, even if it's not, you know, all buddy, buddy, as much as it could be or has been in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I like it, man. This is, so, I mean, just a little reflection yeah. of, you know, my own journey connected to my other journeys and and. um I think if you're a person who finds gratitude in things in general, you're a happier person. But I mean, if you can be a person who can find gratitude that even when it's businesslike, yeah, music is still good. That's that's all right. And even if it's bad, if you trust that um, you'll come out the other side, it's just a time, you know, based upon whatever, you know, that speaks to a strong bond that um, it's just a rare thing. So, you know, the praise to the bands who, who find a way to, you know, go through all these different phases, these stages, these, you know, maturity and immaturity, you know, cycles. Um, it's, it's a really good thing. And I think it creates better art that, you know, makes people happier. I know, uh, I'll give you a good example. Uh, we played Saturday night. We had a great night Saturday night. And um, while I've mostly been going with really, really A-list stuff for some of the gigs, I always, when making set lists, you know, I want to throw some stuff in just to keep the guys thinking, 
doesn't get stale, you know, you know, uh, you know stuff that'll delight the band and, and that type of thing. So I threw in a couple, I threw in a couple things that we haven't played in a while. And I have gotten into the, um, into the habit of posting set lists a couple days in advance, mostly for the horn so they can or- organize their digital books, but um, so they can go page to page. But, um, sure. but, you know, just in case there's something we haven't played in a while, I'll give guys a couple days of heads up. And I, uh, we played a couple. Um, well, here's the dumbest one. I called twist and shout. Okay. No, no brain surgery there. Right. Right. However, like anything else, when it is like, just grooving and people are loving it and the band is actually just loving it and the harmonies just kind of click on top of each other and the energy is there that that one that is created by a bunch of people who like each other and you know root for each other and help you even if it's the simplest thing in the world that is meaningful you know that is um different than if you have hired guns right right yeah for sure for sure yeah yeah no, it, it, yeah, I I like this concept. It's a good thing for all of us to remember that yeah, the the band the band is is it's an important thing. And you have to you know kind of re, to rewind a little bit, you have to be careful not to overmanage this. Um, you know, if you see people t- distancing you you can you could say, hey, you know, I feel like we're falling kind of out of step with each other. I know we're doing all the gigs, but let's get together for dinner. You know, you know, certainly there is a time and a place where that works perfectly. But if the reason that people are falling out of step with each other is that they're super busy externally, now you're adding this this, you know, un well, it's related, but unnecessary pressure onto them to pull everything together and it's like, Oh crap, I don't want to go. And then you've got two guys that, that can't show up for your, you know, for your dinner because they're busy. Now you might've even created a faction or a split that didn't exist because you know, these people are, have managed the band into their busy schedules, but can't really fit anything else. And, 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 it, and that was okay. Un, right up until the point that you sort of forced it, you know, in the wrong direction, but there is a time and a place for that. So you gotta, yeah. But like you, you know, doing things like calling twist and shout on stage, that can be the kind of thing that adds to those bonds without adding any pressure, any time pressure or anything like that. I like, yeah, it's good. That's good. Man. So, cheers to the bands. Cheers to the bands for sure. Yeah. I like it. The, the um, yeah, the the one thing you need, I think that you need to watch out for it, it as you know, if you're in that leadership role in your band is to make sure that the normal, acceptable de- semi detachment of some members doesn't lead to other members of the band feeling like, OK, it's falling apart. Right. Like that's the thing that you kind of do need to manage is looking at the people that are trying to keep it, you know, at that level of everybody's buddy, buddy. And we're all bros and, you know, all of that stuff Uh, that that's the thing to watch out for and sort of nip in the bud. The people that detach a little bit, like you said, I mean, everybody's there at the gigs willingly. Everybody's there at the rehearsals willingly. That's fine. But if you've got somebody that's sweating it and do- and doesn't listen to gig gab, maybe get them to listen or sit them down and just, you know, have this conversation like, hey, you know, it bugs me, too. But, you know, I took a step back and I thought about it managing that because, you know, I've certainly I am that person. And when I'm in a leadership role in a band, I will, you know, I'll freak out about it. Maybe I'll remember this conversation next time I'm in that situation. I won't freak out as much. Um but when I have been the, you know, not leader of a band, I will often, you know, I have found myself saying, OK, well, that band looks like it's sort of fizzling out. I better start. You know, I know that I need to keep playing and I know that if I'm not playing, you know, regularly enough, that drives me crazy. So mm. for in the interest of self-preservation, now I am also going to intentionally detach a little and go find at least something else to to move in parallel with this just to hedge my bets. Because if this thing falls apart, I got to know that I have something else going, you know? So you bring up a really great idea. So, so there's the difference between detachment 
which is, you know, the process of starting to convince yourself this is not the band for you. Right. right? Oh, yeah. No, that's, that's not that's different. Right. Yep. Right. Uh, and, you know, someone who's just not engaged engagement would be the other thing. Right. Right. Engagement might they might be the same thing, but they're not necessarily the same thing. And I think when you say the term the band fizzles out, well, that by the time that's on people's mind, you've got a problem. Right. Well, so maybe I, major, m- maybe I, I don't know. I mean, it, it might be on my mind before it's actually a problem. You know, I'm, I, I look really far ahead on this stuff because I don't want to get caught without. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? No, like no, no. Again, yeah, okay. you're managing an at will situation. So, yes. you know, you're in my band. Yes. And by the time I've asked you to come in my band, I've made a bunch of value judgments about who you are and what kind of fit you'll be and what your totally. personality is and those types of things. I don't know you entirely well, but you know, I, I have tried to choose as wisely as I could yep. at first sight that my assumptions about who you are um, start to uh, have some questions about it. I start to have conversations like, are you cool? How's things going? You know, yeah. those types of things. Yeah. But I think um, there's that fine line and every band is different because of the makeup of every band. And there's the times you know, where a band with a leader who's a fixer um, is appreciated. And there's sometimes where he's forcing something that's just not there. Yep. And I think that that's, that's that again, at will, you know, the, the best bands are guys where you don't have to shepherd all the time. Sometimes the guy just appreciates someone checking on him and the answer is, oh yeah, you know, my kid got an F on a paper and my wife and I are trying to figure out what we're going to do about college. And you know, that, sure. that's, that, and just having someone ask and say, yeah, yeah, now I remember, you know, I got to be more present when I'm here. So, you know, a good leader can open the door for just let people know, you know, when someone telegraphs and that's the really interesting thing. Are they are they disengaged or are they disenfranchised? Right. Is it is it temporary or is it a path to ruin? And, you know, a good leader or a good band you know, I guess you would say if you want to stay continuous, you always have a plan B and a plan C and a plan D. You don't want to go down there. Right. But um, but, uh, you know, at any time it could happen. Right. As much as your bros, you don't want it to happen. Someone can. Yeah. And you never know. You know, who knows what tomorrow will bring them get hit by a truck. Someone can, get, can move. Someone could, you know, get divorced, you know, whatever it could be. Life changes. And in the interest of keeping an ongoing concern, I think people have in their minds ways to do that. Yep. I, I had a guy in my band, you know, say to me, you know, you should really have a, a, a B team, a C team and a D team. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I may have ideas for who those people are, but I'm not going to go down the path where where uh, this becomes a bunch of moving parts. We When we right. go on stage, we're promising our audience that you're going to see the people who you think you're going to see. And, um, you know, I'm still emphatic upon that. I, you know this is a band and I promote every single person in this band as an important part of it. So, you know, some people who think of themselves as temporary, that's a, that's a cancer you really want to nip in the butt, right? right. That's one totally. you don't want. Right. But there is that, that, I mean, just as much as you in, in the leader mindset have your plan B and plan C, your individual members are going to have those too. And and none of those are bad things necessarily, but it's going to, you know, it, it will naturally happen at different stages for each person. You know, as the band is cooking and everything's good, everybody has their own metrics of what's OK. And, you know, it's checking in with the people that are engaged is just as important as checking in with the people that might For have sure. disengaged is I think what I'm trying to say here that you got to really think about like, if this person's engaged, they, that means that they at some level want the experience of a band that is engaged. And if that goes away, you're right. It's not necessarily a bad thing for the band. It's not a bad thing uh, you know, for the business of the band, but it might be a bad thing for that guy. This might not be the experience he wants anymore. Their and guy or, or the other way around. Like you, you chose wrong. You, you chose a guy who he's like, listen, I'm a pro. I will show up. I'll play the hell out of whatever I want, but I've got friends and I've got a family. I don't, this doesn't need to be my extended family. I've been doing this for a while. Yeah. You know, I'm good. Right. Yeah. Right. You, right. That role exists. That's not good or bad. No, whether it's, it's right for thing. your band or not. Right. Is he, is he so good a player? You know, that that, you know, 
you, you can look him in the eye and he says, listen, my, my commitment is my commitment. I'll be there. Right. But I don't need to have beers with you guys you know, I, I, I'll enjoy playing with you, but that's not what I need out of this. Out of the, that's totally viable. That's totally reasonable. Right. As long as decide. everyone else is on page, uh, uh, you know, on yep. board with it. That's the real trick is making sure everybody is. Um, yeah. Is, is there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a tough thing to manage because you're right. You could have an entire band full of, you know, the, 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 the people you just described that are, look, I'm, I'm a pro I'm going to show up and I'm going to do it and I'm going to head home. We don't need beers. We have this. It's totally fine. And then you, you know, there's the, the complete other side of the spectrum where it's like, you know, we, we're going to live together in a van and you know, it's like, we're going to sweat <laughs> together and shower deliver. together. Right. Like all of that. And either of those is okay. But trying to mix those two, I mean, and, and generally people aren't one extreme or the other, you know, it's a continuum, right? So finding, you know, how wide of a range on that continuum your band can survive with is the key. Uh, yeah. 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 It's really, I, I really want to get Mary Ellen on the show, you know, and we've Let's been talking it. about this. We're, we're coming up on our four year anniversary, right? I think it's five, right? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we've been talking about, you know, the woman perspective being in a band is such a unique vibe um, in all different types of ways. Sometimes it adds tremendously often. Sometimes it's, it's a toxic thing. Sometimes it creates, but, you know, anybody could be toxic, right? Sure. But there, it is a unique thing. And I know Mary Ellen, you know, she's got so much experience uh, playing in bands, you know, starting out when she was so young and playing with older men, oh, yeah. playing in bands with her husband, playing in bands without her husband. I mean, that that perspective of, of what it, we're talking about chemistry and, you know, uh, it it is it can be a different vibe. And it's such a, a very valuable thing to understand, you know, as you're putting a band together. I know I've always thought about the house rockers as like our brand is kind of a guy's thing. That's a little misogynistic. I mean, that's, you know, I, I don't know that that it, it should be the best thing. Right. Right. Um, and so, um, you know, sometimes I think about, you know, we want to do some different types of music. Maybe it's time that we think about adding another singer who can hit the really high parts and, you know, we'll be cool. Um, I just think that that's, it's all, you know, like you almost want to employ a sociologist to kind of like, I see what's happening. Those two people are kind of connecting on that level and it's making threatening these two people. And it's, you know, th this stuff happens all the time. All the time. I find my lesson over 21 years of leading this band is lessons about when to assert leadership and when to, when to lean back and just let it play out and remember that it's at will. And I'm going to create the best situation I can. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to keep us working. I'm going to get you paid. We're going to play decent places. That is my promise to you as a leader. Do you want that? Yes. What I need from you is I need you to learn your stuff. I need you to come with good attitude. I need you to play, play well. Yeah. I don't require people to be a bro, but I try to create an environment where people would want to be. People are know? comfortable Every, with each other. Yeah. 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 And, um, uh, yeah, I think, um, that is that is the best reflection that I can share here that over time I used to force it when I started. Hey, let's go out to dinner. Hey, you know, can I take you to lunch? Hey, you know, all these types of things. And it might have bought me a little goodwill in the beginning or a little belief that I was very serious about the project and was gonna and that, I was gonna do everything I could to make it make Yeah, it that's rise. fair. Yeah, yeah, sure. But over time, trying to solve every spiff that happens between, you know, two guys or whatever it is, you know, trying to, you know. You, you sometimes just got to let it be and, and let the phases of broness, no broness, businesslike. And I'm sure everyone can add other degrees of which the vibe of their band changes over time. I mean, tell me about Uptown. That's largely businesslike, right? Nice people. You enjoy them. You show totally. up, you play. Yep. Yep. Right? yep. That's totally. not a bad situation. That's a, that's a common situation. Yeah. I mean, we, we get along very, very well. Uh, we really have developed a nice vibe together, but, but it starts, especially in that band, it started with business and it's still the majority of it is business, but you know, you spend enough time with people, 
But it, it, you, you develop bonds, you learn about each other's lives, that sort yeah. of thing. And and there are guys in that band that know each other way better than I know any of the people in that band. You know, I and, and I don't even know the full depth of those relationships necessarily. I mean, you know, you just sort of pick things up as as things move along. But it's like, oh, well, I, those two guys, I think they've known each other for like 20 years, you know, even though this band's only seven years old. Right. Um and that's fine, you know, and they clearly talk with each other separate from the, like you'll hear about, oh yeah, well, you know, Jim and I were together the other day and we did this other thing and it's like, oh, that's interesting. Like, I don't think about you and Jim being together other than when we play Uptown gigs. Not that it's a problem. It's just, I don't think about it. And then you suddenly mention offhanded, like, oh yeah, well, I was him, out with him and we were talking about this other thing. It's like, oh, isn't that interesting? Okay. That's fine. You know, it, but it is that band is very, I don't feel excluded, like not in, in, in an intentional way. It's just mm -hmm. those two people have a, a relation a, you know, a friendship with each other and that's okay. Uh, but that is, it is a little bit different than your, you know, all for one, one for all kind of thing uh, that can happen in some bands too. And, and, and you, I mean, I think, it can be a bad thing. I've been in bands where, you know, clicks have developed uh, and that can be bad where, you know, amongst the band and about the band, things are happening that are almost intentionally excluding, you know, some other group of, uh, you know, of the, the same bandmates that can be bad. Uh, and you got to watch. And I would out say as that. a leader that, that, that almost always is bad, but as a leader, how do you, you know, you don't say, you know, you, you don't engage in high school stuff and say, hey, you, you know, you're being mean to so-and-so. I think as a leader, what you do is you you lead by example and you demonstrate the value of each person. So when you introduce the band members, you're making everyone feel like they're an important part of a whole. I mean, that's just a, well, that's I'm, a real. I'm talking uh, about more, let's say, you know, in, in Fling, let's say Russ and I go out to lunch, right? Uh, and while we're at lunch, we're talking about our, our, you know, our kids and our lives and work and all this other stuff. And then some fling bit of, you know, idea comes up because we happen to also play in this band together in addition to these other things we have in common. Right. We in that moment, we should talk. We should let it happen because we're friends and that's fine. But there should be no like decisions made, you know, it's like, okay, let's bring this Yeah, This is a good idea. Let's, you know, let's see what the other guys think of it. That like mm. it's when it, when it becomes this, oh, okay, well we're going to, we worked out this thing. We're going to do it at the gig. Don't worry about it. You know, Russ and I worked it out. It will, you guys just follow along that kind of stuff. Certainly it's going to happen from time to time, but if it, if it happens too much, and everybody's not just on board with, OK, well, those are the two crazy people in the band that come up with these wacky things. Let's just go. Let's just follow it. Like sometimes and I've been in bands where I'm the guy that is in the follow role of those. Sometimes that's the best thing for the band, because if that's the thing that, you know, helps propel the business of the band forward, you got to kind of let the crazy, you know, songwriters or whatever they're doing mm -hmm. do their thing. No, I mean, I, like that, that for sure is an important element of some bands not every band but but everybody kind of has to be on board with it it can't be an intentional exclusion where the people that are being excluded are not okay with it i guess that's really what it comes down to is so what know, i what i was saying is when i sense that 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 is happening a little bit yeah my uh my leadership sense says <clears throat> don't go into the teeth of that double down with the people who might feel excluded yep. and let them know as the leader, I see you, you're doing a great job. You know, I'm so glad you're in the band. Yep. Right. And, and yep. so it, it, instead of, you know, again, you, you don't want to be high school -y about it, right. You don't want to, right. you don't want to be junior high school about it. Right. You, you don't want to feed it. You don't want to, you know, th that's what I'm saying. Bands are families, they're groups they're you know, and within people, there's certain dynamics that just happen. And, you know, if you've chosen wisely and you've brought good people into your band to begin with, and that can include that guy who says, listen, I don't need to be your bro, but I want to be in your band. You know, that's just one form of a, of a personality that you got to deal with. And this is why to me, again, I'm, I'm, I know a good thing when I see it and I'll join that, but I, you know, in general, in my life, prefer to organize and, and sure. lead and assemble. Right. You know? And so I, this is why you, some of the most interesting conversations you and I have is, I don't get democratic bands. 
I get that they exist and some of them thrive, but my mind just goes like, well, th- this is rife, <laughs> rife for terror, right? This is, you know, a problem's <laughs> going to happen and who's going to solve it? That guy's right. never going to speak up because he never speaks up. And, and you know, I don't know if, if the decision that's made on his behalf because he doesn't speak up is, is going to work for him. But, is that I the mean, right decision? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so I, um, I, that, that's just something that throws my, my small brain for, for a pretty big loop is like, no, you know. <laughs> you know, create something that is somewhat predictable and, and, and allow it, allow it to, you know, nurture it, feed it, allow it to grow and, you know, help every, and that's where the reward is for me is when, you know, if you've created something that's good that people love and, you know, want to be a part of, and again, at will give their time and their talents and their art to it. And that to me is, that to me is the noble path. Um, but I get it there, you know, it's not the only path. Yeah, it, it is. It is a noble path. path. Yeah, my exactly. brain just can't wrap its hand. <laughs> I can't wrap my brain around around the pure democratic path because well, it never is and purely I think, democratic. Yeah, it's not actually purely democratic. I've never I've been in bands that would most definitely be de- described as, you know, fully democratic bands. And but I can tell you from the inside, there's no there's it's never purely democratic. It might. But if you look at the arc of, you know, the band, it might be, well, you know, that person or those people sort of took the reins initially. And then and then it sort of morphed into these people. And then it was back to those guys. And, you know, like those sorts of things. That's normal. That's just human dynamics. Um, But but that, you know, so it's never as cut and dry. It's not this binary thing of there is a leader or there's no leader. Like, well, that's not exactly <laughs> how this goes. <laughs> like somebody is in charge of each thing, whether it's the same person for all the things or not. That's where it starts to, you know, for me, the line moves, you know, there's at some point you say, okay, well, this is a democratic band. It's not a, (laughs) it's not a leader led band, but it doesn't mean there's no leaders. It just means that things are a little more distributed than, than otherwise, but divisional labor always happens, you know, I mean, amorphous for me. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, think about it this way. I'm I'm recognizing that it's a fault of mine that, you know, there, there may be an opportunity for something better to exist. I don't know if it's it's better. It's just different. Yeah. Just different. But it's, it's like, (laughs) well, we could spend a whole episode describing this and never get there, But, (laughs) but you know, perhaps a way to look at it is every time you guys get to a gig, you tacitly, Dis- decide who's going to play the drums and who's going to play the bass and who's going to play the keys. You know what I mean? Like those, those decisions uh, are being made without a leader there to make them, but everybody's sort of deciding right now. I mean, I know that's, that's a little bit absurd to, to, to bring that up as the example, but that's, you know, th- that also happens in leaderless bands. Like people show up and know what instrument they're going to play. Like there, there is a, 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 a decision tree that's happening and it's like, yeah, that guy is going to play drums tonight. And we all knew that coming in, you know, there's no surprise. (laughs) No, it's not, it's not just being decided while we're walking on stage. Huh? What instruments should we each play? I mean, sometimes that's fun to do is sort of a a gaffe, but you know, you know that it's a bit of a gaffe. So I don't know. Anyway, I feel like we've hit everything here. I do want to, I want to, sort of take a brief second here and just acknowledge, you know, we started talking about recording. Actually, I want to not today, but I really want to dig into the right gear to have in your home studio to record, including I'm starting to think about like what mixers are the right mixers to use for your band that can both serve live and recording. I've actually started having conversations with various different mixing companies, really digging into these things so that we can dig into that together here. And I'll, I'll have more to say on that in a future episode. That said, uh, there is one bit of technology that I want to shout out to. And that is that MIDI, M-I-D-I, the, uh, oh, I can't even remember what it stands for, but the musical, musical instrument, instrument, digital instrument, interface, digital interface. Thank you, sir. Uh, has been, there's a new standard. And it's up to two point version 2.0. And what's cool about MIDI 2.0 is a couple of different things. Number one, it uh, it's bi-directional, which means that your devices can query the capabilities of the things to which they're connected. So that's huge. And it doesn't have to go across 
uh, one type of cable. It can it can be sent over USB or, or really anything. I think it's more of a communications protocol. It's not just limited to you got to use that, you know, whatever DIN 9 cable that 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 we're that we're, you know, thinking about. And there's more data that can be sent that it, it's, you know, it's got faster, um, faster communication, but also because of that more granularity to it. So instead of having, I think it's 128 settings per thing. I think it's 32,000, you know, gradations per, uh, per channel or whatever, so that you get, you know, closer to that analog feel out of, you know, the th- the data that MIDI can send. So it, it, it truly is a, a huge step up and I don't, I haven't messed with any new MIDI devices yet. It's all backwards compatible. So if you wind up getting something that's MIDI 2.0, it by definition has to support talking to MIDI 1.0 stuff, which is really important. Smart. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Otherwise, it, you might don't it, let's if, if you're going to come up with something different that's not backwards compatible, just don't call it MIDI, I think would be my 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 advice on that. Uh, but yeah, so this is it, it's actually really exciting. It came out at I think they announced it at NAMM uh, last month. And so I just wanted to acknowledge it here. If anybody has any thoughts about that or really any of this, if you have a mixer that you're using, like I said, I'm, I'm really starting to look for the right mixer that that works great live. But you can also take it to the studio, plug a USB cable into your computer. And now you're using it as your recording interface. So you don't have to buy a separate thing. And I know, you know, every whatever it seems to be every three to five years, bands seem to buy new mixers. So you know, this is sort of the the research for your next wave of of purchases. If if what you have isn't already capable, and it very well might be. So, if you've got any thoughts about that, send those in to feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We would love to hear from you because um, it's what we do. We you know we we do this for you. We do it for us too, obviously. But you know, we do it for five you. years really. It will be five years in seven days. Oh, in nine, nine days. Um, Next, what, Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday the 19th will be the fifth year anniversary of our first released episode, which was actually episode two. You, you folks never heard episode zero or one, but, uh, but after we recorded episode two, we decided, yep, it can come out. So, uh, so it did. So yeah, it was, uh, it was 2015. So I'm pretty sure that's five years, man. Yeah. So we're real close. Beauty. We're real Beauty. close. Yeah, I know. All right. Well, that'll do it. We, we topped an hour yet again. We got to we got to uh, we need a producer, Paul. We got to have somebody to reel us in. I think when we're doing this show, we're always performing. That's the problem. But that's a good a lot thing. of gabbing. Wait. A lot of gabbing. A lot of gabbing. Too much gabbing. No, yeah. never enough. 